special days at The Journey, that we are starting into a new teaching series. We're starting into a brand new book of the Bible here. For us, we've been in Proverbs, and we're, we're getting into the book of Mark today. So um, I, I, I just get a, a little skip in my step every time we start a new teaching series, and especially on a Sunday, which we have a whole extra hour to rest and to be ready to learn. So I hope you spent your extra hour sleeping and uh, getting ready for, t- for today. But I know every, t- every time I end uh, a teaching series over the book of the Bible, I get a little anxious because once I settle into a book, I, I, I develop a special appreciation for it and I get comfortable in it. And um, it's only when I get done teaching through a book of the Bible that I feel confident enough, confident enough to, to preach through that book. Uh, so that confidence comes at the end. Uh, confidence anyway. Um, so here I am starting this new book. But you know, every time I teach through a book of the Bible, it gives me a, a special appreciation for what that book has to offer us, for how God uses that book uh, individually to change us in a special way. Proverbs was all about wisdom. It tweaked the way that I think about wisdom, having preached through Proverbs, especially those first nine chapters in which we're taught how to approach wisdom, how to think about wisdom, why we should desire wisdom, what it does for us, what God is offering us. I mean, it's just changed what I think about wisdom and the the wisdom of God. And so I, I I, I I have this deeper appreciation and love for the book of Proverbs now. And and so here we are moving from Proverbs, though, having been sharpened by it to be sharpened in a different way through the gospel of Mark. And so Mark has been the means by which God has informed his people of his gospel since, since the beginning of Christianity. You think of how many resources there are right now trying to inform you about Jesus. Think about over the past 2,000 years, how many books have been written about Jesus? And now we live in the information age in which it all just like multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. And you think, how many books about Jesus have been written in the past year alone? How, how many blogs have been written about Jesus just this weekend? I mean, anytime someone sets out to write a resource about who Jesus is, they're trying to influence you. When they write a blog about who Jesus is or some aspect of the gospel, they're trying to change the way you think about the gospel of Jesus or who he is or, or what he taught or something about him. And, and so all of this gets a little bit overwhelming when you think about it, especially in the day and age that we live. And so, I mean, When you you start sorting through all of these books and resources and theologians that have existed over the course of 2,000 years, it's just overwhelming. What do I do with all of this information? How do I know what's right? How do I know what's wrong? There's so many divisions within Christianity. It's it's easy, easy to get confused. So when you get in that frame of mind, I think it's so important for all of us as believers to realize, hey, we can always just go back to the beginning. What informed Christians initially? What was it that changed the way they think? What was it that initially informed believers as to who Jesus was, what he taught, what he did, and what it means? Well, we have, we have the gospel of Mark. What you hold in your hands is what those first century Christians held in their hands. I mean, you think of how astounding that is. Mark was the first of the four gospels that were written. It was the first of the four Gospels to circulate amongst God's people. I think that's pretty incredible in and of itself. When you look at your Bible, it's, it's, it's broken up into the Old Testament and, and into the New Testament. And so within the Old Testament, those Old Testament books are not categorized chronologically. Well, the same thing is true about the New Testament. The New Testament is not categorized chronologically. So they're not put in order of how they were written. They're actually a bunch, those books are bunched together in genres. You think of a, like music genres. You got jazz, you got blues, you got rock and roll, you got hip hop, you got all these different genres of music. Well, the Bible is kind of set up that way too. When you go into the New Testament, the, the books of the New Testament are grouped together in genres. And so the first genre that you get to is the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so Mark or Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are known as the synoptic 
Gospels. Why are they called the Synoptic Gospels? Because they are a synopsis of the life of Jesus. These Gospels set out to say this happened and then this happened and then this happened. They are a synopsis of the life of Jesus. And so Mark, though, was written first and circulated first amongst the, the, uh, the first century believers. And so when historians and, and translators and Greek theologians look at the, the four Gospels in Greek, it's easy to tell that Matthew and Luke both looked off of Mark and considered his content as they wrote their Gospels because a lot of Mark's content is present in both Matthew and Luke's Gospels. And then John, he's in a kind of a category of his own. I, I love the Gospel of John, and we worked through that book, but that, that's kind of like a, uh, John kind of functions like, a, like, a, you're, you're, like he's, he's making a case for Jesus, and he, he just picks out kind of like 21 days of the life of Jesus and wants to teach us the meaning of those days. So it's in kind of a, a league of its own, but, but Mark, Mark circulated first. And so again, just think of how astonishing that is. And, and how much the gospel of Jesus has changed the world that we live in today. And the first content that really started circulating to teach people about Jesus was Mark. Before 2,000 years worth of books were written, there was Mark. Before 2,000 blogs were written yesterday, there was Mark. Mark was written by Mark. <laughs> Uh, he was actually referred to as John Mark, and, we, and we, we can read about John Mark in the book of Acts. He's mentioned in several of the uh, letters in the New Testament. And so John Mark, if you remember in our time in Acts, in Acts 15, he, he comes on the scene very briefly. And so John Mark would travel, was traveling with the apostle Paul, and we know that Paul did those three big missionary journeys in the, in the book of Acts. And so that initial journey there, John Mark was with Paul, and and. and you hang, if you're hanging with Paul preaching the gospel like life is hard, things didn't always go very smoothly when you're hanging out with Paul on his missionary journeys. And for John Mark, it became too much. He abandons, he, he abandoned Paul. He took off. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm headed, I'm out. I'm heading back to Jerusalem. And so Paul took that personally. And so when he circles back and, and gets ready to start another missionary journey, Barnabas is there with Paul, and Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark. And Paul's like, you mean the guy that abandoned me? Yeah, no thanks. I don't think I'll take him this time. He was a burden to have. And when he, let, when he bailed on us, he left us high and dry, so let's not take John Mark. And, and Barnabas is like, no, uh, listen, take it easy. Let's take John Mark with us. Well, Paul and Barnabas, I mean, Paul and Barnabas is like peanut butter and jelly. They're best buds, right? They actually get in such a sharp dispute over John Mark, they're like, you know what? Okay, fine, Paul, you go that way, I'll go this way with John Mark. You spread the gospel that way, I'll spread the gospel this way. We, we don't even wanna do ministry together, we're so frustrated with one another right now. And so when John Mark comes on the scene and acts, he's a point of controversy. But we know that later in the letters that Paul wrote, he actually speaks of John Mark very fondly, and he actually requests John Mark. And so we know that that relationship was reconciled and he evidently proved himself over time to the Apostle Paul. But John Mark also worked very closely with Peter. And so when you see uh, the, the letters that Peter wrote in the New Testament, 1 Peter, for example, at the end of 1 Peter, he references John Mark and refers to him in a really special way. He's, he, he talks about John Mark as if it's his own son. So Peter and John Mark were very close. And John Mark interviewed Peter and learned from Peter and actually records his eyewitness account. And it's known as the Gospel of Mark. And so I think it's interesting, though, that we, as we're reading Mark, we're, we're reading Peter's influence. Now, we know ultimately Mark, as he wrote the, the Gospel, uh, the, uh, as he wrote his Gospel, he was influenced by God the Holy Spirit. Everyone who writes a book in the Bible is under, uh, uh, is under um, the influence of the Holy Spirit and, and wrote those books by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we also see personalities come through as the Holy Spirit uses his people to, to, to write God's word. And I think Peter's personality kind of comes through 
in the Gospel of Mark. Because I think you can tell that in a few ways. You know, it's, Mark is, a, is the shortest of all of the Gospels. You could go home this afternoon and within a couple of hours, even if you're a really, really slow reader, you can read the entire Gospel in a couple of hours. Um, it, it's, it's a very efficient Gospel. It's short, it's sweet, it's to the point. It's, real, it's very straightforward, and that kind of reminds me of Peter's personality. He's kind of a no-nonsense type of guy. I get excited anytime I think about Peter just because I think he's the most relatable person in the New Testament. Anytime you're reading about Peter, there's just this immediate human connection that we make with him. Um, Peter doesn't mess around. Peter was confrontational. Even when Jesus would say something that Peter didn't like, Peter would confront him. And then Jesus would have to say things like, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> right? We know that Peter is a risk taker. I mean, you think of the, the, the moment in which Peter's witnessing Jesus walking on the water. He has the presence of mind to request that he go out on the water with him. Like, of all the things that would be going through your mind in that moment, like, Peter's just ready to do. He's ready to, to take action. And so I think that speaks to the efficiency of this book. But he's also a very just individual you know, Peter's the type of guy that when Jesus is getting ready to be arrested by an army of individuals, Peter, he, while we would all be stunned, he already has a sword out swinging it around. I mean, Peter is just ready to, to get stuff done without hesitation. And so being that no-nonsense guy is Peter's best quality. It's also his worst quality. But I, I think having lived through what he lived through, and being able to see what he saw and being on the other side of it. I just, when I'm reading Mark, and I want to encourage you to think of it this way too. I, I just kind of get the sense of Peter sitting us down and saying, okay, here's what you need to know. And so that appeals to a lot of people. And you think, of, maybe, maybe some of you think like that. You're kind of a no-nonsense no type of person. Just get to the point. Mark is your gospel. This is Peter sitting down and saying, here's what I want you to know. And so there's a lot that is not in Mark's gospel that is in Matthew's gospel, and that's in Luke's gospel, and that's in John's gospel. Like you, the first thing we notice when we get into the gospel of Mark, there's no nativity story. And the na nativity, that's like origin. That means origin. There's no origin story of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. It's not that that isn't important. There's other gospels for that. He's just streamlining the story of the gospel for us. There's nothing about the early life of Jesus as it is as there is in Luke. There's no story of Jesus at the temple as a boy or anything like that. And comparatively, when you're thinking about John, Luke, and Matthew compared to Mark, you'll find so much more of Jesus' teaching, like his sermons and his sayings in Matthew, Luke, and John uh, than you would find in Mark. However, Mark mentions more miracles. In his shorter gospel, he mentions more miracles than Matthew, uh, Luke, and John in his gospel. And again, I just think that speaks to that no-nonsense, all-action type of attitude that Peter has. As a matter of fact, when you read in this gospel, in the gospel of Mark, we'll see the, the word immediately, like 42 times, or the word that translates to immediately. He's saying, this happened, and then immediately, this happens. And then immediately, this happens. I mean, he's streamlining the story again so that he can get right to the point and he's teaching us the gospel in a very special, no-nonsense way, getting through this information so that you can know the gospel of Jesus quickly. And, and I think there's a reason for that too. Being that this was the first gospel that circulated, it circulated in a really interesting time. Now, I always preach context, context, context. If you want to understand a biblical passage, you need to understand, you can't just pluck a verse out and teach something about Jesus. You need to understand the context. What's the, what's the paragraph saying that that sentence lies in? What's the chapter saying that that paragraph lies in? What's the book saying that that chapter is in? You need context, 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 but also something else that is important is historical context. And we know a lot of things that were going on in that time a lot of things that uh, it makes sense that an efficient gospel would be needed. There is a sense of urgency in the air. If you were a first century Christian, you were in danger. You were in danger all the time. So I want us to just kind of, just for a second, before we get into the first few verses, put yourself in the shoes 
of a first century believer. Turn back the clock to the 60s, like the original 60s. There was a lot going on, and a lot of it was really, really bad. When you were a Christian in Rome, where Mark would have circulated for the first time, when you were a, a Christian in Rome, you heard about the gospel and, and, and you saw violence taking place against people who believed this gospel. As a matter of fact, Peter, who influenced Mark to write this book, and, and we're getting his eyewitness account, he had just been martyred in Rome. And, and Peter was like, hey, if you're going to kill me for preaching the gospel, don't kill me like Jesus. I'm not even worthy to be killed like him. And so Rome was like, sure, no problem. So they crucified Peter upside down. And so you, that's the kind of stuff that's happening around you as you hear whispers and rumors of this gospel of Mark circulating in your community. What is this information that he preached that got him in so much trouble? Why does Emperor Nero hate Christians so much? What is it about this message that Emperor Nero is killing everyone? Because Emperor Nero was a psycho. This guy was crazy, and he hated Christians. He would publicly execute Christians for fun and as a political distraction as well. And so a lot of people didn't like Emperor Nero, and he was under a lot of pressure from Rome and, and the people that lived in there, both believers and non-believers. And so he wasn't liked because he, he, had, he had a lot of problems going on, uh, but he needed a distraction. You know, sometimes in politics, when uh, you're not doing a very good job, you need a little misdirection. Well, it's believed that in the mid-60s, things were going so bad for Nero that he lit a fire in Rome. And they could never prove this, but this was always uh, what historians believed from that point forward, is that he actually caught Rome on fire himself to give everyone a distraction. He didn't like everybody talking about him and talking about how they were frustrated with him. So he lit this fire. Well, it burns down like 70% of Rome. And so everyone loses like everything. And during this fire and as they're working to put it out and everybody's frustrated and panicked and what's gonna happen, he's like, you know who lit that fire? Christians. Christians lit that fire. They're the problem. And so he, it was a misdirection. He got everyone to just hate on Christians. And so he began to start publicly executing Christians to appease the anger and the frustration that existed in Rome. He did this in all sorts of different ways. A few that I read this week, though, uh, that were new to me. Uh, one way that I read he killed Christians is that he would uh, take animal furs and wrap uh, Christians up in them so that their wild attack dogs would mull them to death. And so they would, they would put animal fur on your, your limbs and around your body and send you running in the streets and then release the hounds. And you would be chewed to death in the streets. And that was a way to appease the frustrated people in Rome. Another thing that he did that was new to me, um, he, he would take Christians and he would um, dip them in, in pitch and in tar. And he would impale them and put them in his garden so at night he could light their bodies on fire as he took a stroll to relax. That's Nero. That's the kind of guy they're, they're dealing with there. He's a savage. And so, of course, the most popular, the most well-known ways that Christians were executed in that time, were it was the Colosseum, right? That's where you would pay money to be entertained. And the way that you were entertained, in addition to gladiators fighting and things like that, is that they would... They would put Christians in the middle of that Colosseum and kill them in all sorts of different ways that we won't get into. But one of the most popular ways is they would feed them to the lions. And so you would get to, to watch a Christian uh, being eaten alive at the Colosseum on a Friday night. And so he did all of this as a, as, as a misdirection. And so, so you got this swirling mess of political turmoil um, uh, religions colliding, the gospel is spreading, prominent Christian leaders are being publicly executed, and, 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 and you're a believer here wondering, what is it about Jesus that has just shaken this environment that I live in? What is it about the gospel 
that people are being killed in such a gruesome way. You would be curious and you'd want to learn more. The stakes were so, so high. What could possibly be in the gospel of Mark that people are dying in this way? Well, let's turn to Mark chapter 1. And let's read the first three verses to get started. It says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That gospel, that means good news. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew term Messiah. Messiah means anointed one or favored one by God. This is not only the anointed one that had been prophesied long, long ago. This is the anointed one who is also the son of God. This is the good news of this man. And so the Jews were promised this Messiah. All throughout the Old Testament, many messianic prophecies led to great anticipation for this coming king. They were waiting for him. When would this happen? How would this unfold? They had many messianic prophecies that clued them in as to how this would un unravel in their day. And so one of the things they learned about this coming Messiah, or learned to expect about this coming Messiah, is that there would be a forerunner to this coming king. That makes perfect sense. Because any time a king would arrive anywhere, there would always be a forerunner. That's how things worked in that day. And so if a king was going to come to your town, months before he arrived, a forerunner would go there first and prepare the way. And I mean literally prepare the way like he would go to the streets and the roads and they would, they would lower hills. They would, it, it, they would make sure that those turns weren't as sharp, that the bridges were safe and things like that. The way there would be, would be made right. And so if a king was coming to your town, it was good in that literally all of the roads would be in better shape by the time that he got there. And so that's how an arrival would happen with a king. A forerunner would go there in advance and warn everyone, be ready, put on your best, prepare the way. A king is on the way. Things are about to change. And so you think, well, no wonder Nero felt so threatened, right? He's like, this is, this is, this is my house. I'm the emperor here. I'm in control here. You're going to preach a gospel about a coming king in, in my house, in my territory? We're going to squash this like a bug. It's no wonder he felt so threatened. He felt obligated as the emperor to just squash the gospel. And so this forerunner, we're told, is one crying in the wilderness. we got that Isaiah passage, and actually it has uh, hints of Malachi in it as well. One crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now that wilderness language, that also would have been something very familiar to people who knew the Old Testament. We think of prophets in the Old Testament who would have interacted and engaged God in, in, in the wilderness. Where did Moses interact with God with that burning bush? He was in the wilderness. Elijah was ministered to by God in the wilderness by ravens. And of course, maybe even think about it this way. Where did God's people go when they were rescued from slavery from the Egyptians? They went into the wilderness and God took care of them there. And so here's this forerunner announcing the coming king, and he is one that cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Light bulbs would have come on for everyone reading this. So who was this prophesied forerunner, and what was his message? Let's continue in verses 4 through 5. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So to say that John the Baptist had a popular ministry would be an incredible understatement. All of Judea 
went out to hear this guy talk. All of Jerusalem. Now, anytime you see that word all in the New Testament, that's always a, a word that Christians argue about. What is the scope of all? What, exactly, when you say all, what do you mean by that? And often is the case, as it is in this, it's, this is hyperbole. This is an exaggeration to make a point. And so did every last human being in Judea and Jerusalem go out to hear John the Baptist? Well, we know that's not the case because we see later in the Gospels that, that priests who had not gone out to listen to John the Baptist, they send people to investigate so that they could come back and teach them what exactly is going on. And so we, we know that the scope of all here is, is being used to exaggerate the point that this was a wildly popular ministry that John the Baptist had. And so as a matter of fact, when you, when you start to read in commentaries and, and read what histori historians and archaeologists find uh, in first century literature, John the Baptist is mentioned more than Jesus. They find more writings concerning John the Baptist than they even do Jesus, who he prepared the way for. And so this cry from the wilderness, it was loud. And he did something very unique with this message. He came baptizing. He came baptizing with a baptism of repentance. Now that would have sparked controversy because they only had one category for baptism. So you and I, we, we talk about baptisms and we have baptisms and so this is very common in our culture. So for them, they had a category for baptism but it's nothing like what we think. They believed in a proselyte baptism. And so here's what would happen. If you were an ethnic Jew, you didn't have to have a proselyte baptism. You were, you were Jewish. But everybody else on the planet Earth was a Gentile. If you're not ethnically Jew, you're a Gentile. That's the word in the Bible that refers to everybody who's not eth ethnically Jew. But if you were a Gentile and you wanted to embrace what the Jews believe and you want to participate in worship and Judaism. Well, what you would do is you would undergo a proselyte baptism because you were immoral. You were unclean. You weren't Jewish. And so they would baptize you to symbolize this cleansing that you needed in order to participate in worship with the rest of the Jews. So John the Baptist comes on the scene. He's going into the River Jordan and he's, he's baptizing Jews. And so they're like, what, what are you doing? The religious elite, they're, they're starting to hear stories of John, the, Bapti John the, the Baptist baptizing ethnic Jews. And they're like, what are you doing? We don't have a category for this. You're treating Jews like they're just Gentiles or something. And he's like, yeah, you're exactly right. Because you're all unclean. You're all morally corrupt. And I'm preparing the way for the Messiah. You're all dirty. You're all not ready. You need to confess your sins. And you all need to express that confession and that repentance in an act of baptism, just like a Gentile would if he was converting to our faith. And so that got the attention of everyone. That startled Judea. That startled all of Jerusalem. And so everyone was curious because alarms were going off. This guy's doing something that's never been done before and everybody seems to be on board. So what is happening? So what he was saying startled everybody. What he was doing startled everybody. Also what he was wearing startled everybody. Look at verse six. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. So here's this guy. He's living off the land, but he's doing so in a very unique way. He, he's doing so in classic prophetic attire. And so this is a classic description of an Old Testament prophet. And so if someone came dressed up in our service today wearing camel's hair and a leather belt, they would stick out like a sore thumb. What are you doing? Someone back in that day, if they show up in camel's hair and a leather belt, they would also say, what are you doing? Are you in a costume? I think last week we had 
uh, kids came to church to, to wear, and they wore costumes and things like that, right? We did our trunk or treat. Well, when we saw people in their costumes, we saw those little kids in their costumes, we know immediately what they're going for, right? The first kid I saw last Sunday was, uh, was little Nora Bruni. She comes around the corner. You're Wednesday from the Adams family. I knew immediately when I saw her what was going on. Well, if you were, were going out in that day and age and in that culture and you went out into the wilderness to listen to John the Baptist preach and the first thing you see is this guy dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, they'd be like, we know what you're doing. I, we know what you're going for. That's, that's Old Testament prophetic attire that we can see clearly you're wearing camel's hair for a reason and a leather belt. In 2 Kings Chapter 1, verse 8, Elijah is described in almost exactly the same way. He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And so in Malachi, we're told that this prophet Elijah would return and prepare the way of the Lord. And, and here comes John the Baptist, dressed like Elijah, preparing the way of the Lord. Now, for someone to be dressed like a prophet, preaching and teaching like a prophet, preparing the way for the Lord like a prophet and like was prophesied, there had not been a prophet on the scene by this point in time for hundreds of years. For like 400 years, a prophet had not spoken for God. So there was a lot of anticipation, a lot of waiting and wondering when is this going to take place. As a matter of fact, even today, if you were to eat a Seder dinner to celebrate Passover, with a traditional Jewish family, when you would walk into their dining table, you would see that one seat at the table is vacant. No one is sitting there and no one is allowed to sit there. You know why? Because that's for Elijah. Just in case he returns, he's got a spot to sit down and eat with us. And so in that day, they were expecting Elijah still as well. And so in in John's gospel, we're even told this detail that when the, the priests went out to investigate John the Baptist, the first question that they asked him is this, are you Elijah? That's how obvious it was. That the first question they asked, are, are you Elijah? And he says, no, I'm not Elijah. Luke's gospel clears it up in chapter 1, verse 17. He describes what's taking place here. He summarizes what's happening with John the Baptist. He says that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready the, uh, for the Lord a people prepared. So John the Baptist in his ministry set off a lot of alarms by what he said, by what he did, by how he dressed. And he's using all of this lingo to notify and prepare God's people. Hey, you're about ready to be redeemed. Get ready. Hey, you're about all, you're, you're all going to be restored. The Messiah is coming. Restored, redeemed, how so? How will this Messiah do this? Let's continue in verses 7 through 8. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so immediately in the first paragraph of, of, of the Gospel of Mark, we are taught so much as to what we are to know as Christians. We're, 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 we're clued in as to several things that we need to know and believe. You need to confess your sins to prepare for Jesus. You need to repent. You need to be baptized. But that's not enough. John the Baptist teaches that very clearly. I've come to baptize you with water. He's, he's come to preach, he's come to prepare, he's come to, to teach as to what's happening. He's come to set off all the alarms and baptize people in water. You can do all that stuff and you can confess and repent and, that's, and be baptized and that's wonderful, but it's not enough to save you. Something more has to happen. One, that is come, one who is coming is mightier than I and he's gonna baptize you in the Holy Spirit. This reminds me of how Paul puts it in the book of Titus. I think Paul summarizes it so beautifully in Titus 3, 4 through 6. He says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. 
And so John's ministry to prepare the way, it was announced like this. Hey, the Messiah is coming. And the Holy Spirit is coming with him. That's how White Earp would say it, I guess. I, I, <laughs> I think about it. But the Messiah is coming. And the Holy Spirit's coming with him. And he's going to change everything. He's going to restore everything. It's all going to happen through this Messiah, Jesus. And I'm, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and interact with him like a slave would with their master. This is the king. Let's read 9 through 11. Because it ha- what, he's, what he's prepared the way for, it immediately happens. Because that's how Mark works. This happened and then boom, this happens. Verses 9 through 11 says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of, of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And he came up out of the water. Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Let's ask an obvious question. Why was Jesus baptized? Sometimes it's great to go back to the beginning and just renew everything that we know. Why was Jesus baptized? I I thought baptism was something that you did after you confessed your sins and admitted that you weren't worthy. I thought baptism was something you did as an act of repentance and an outward display of an inward decision. Why would Jesus then request to get baptized like everybody else there? Because that was an act that would symbolize your admission to sin and that you needed cleansed from that sin. We know even in the text itself, God says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We know all through the New Testament, Jesus is sinless. That's taught to us very explicitly. So so why then did he get baptized? This This is Jesus who did everything perfectly in his life. This is Jesus who when John sees him, we see this this detail in in, in the gospel of John, that when when John spots him in this moment, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus then, we see this detail in Matthew. When Matthew talks about it, he says, Jesus comes up to to John and and requests to get baptized. baptized, and, And John's like, whoa. I'm not even worthy to untie your shoe, right? I'm not even worthy to untie your sandal. You should be baptizing me. This is not how this should be playing out. And Jesus says that he does this to fulfill all righteousness. We know that Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life. And there were things that he had to do to prove his righteousness. And this was one of those things. It was to fulfill all righteousness, not because he was sinful. It was to associate himself with the guilty. This is Jesus who, as he does often in his ministry, he places himself amongst the guilty to redeem them. He places himself amongst the guilty, not for his salvation, but for their salvation, to save us from the wrath of God. So the Spirit descended upon Jesus And God said he was pleased with him. And in our faith in Christ, the Spirit will descend upon us so that we can be pleasing to God. So Jesus came to make all of this possible. So in the first 11 verses, we read in the Gospel of Mark, this efficient gospel, that the prophesied forerunner came to announce the king, and he did so in a very noticeable way. He's telling everybody to confess and repent and be baptized to prepare. And he's he's telling everybody that the prophesied Messiah had arrived and he will arrive with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we see those things take place immediately in his gospel. And so we're called to know this because you and I are supposed to hear this gospel and to prepare in the same way. You and I are supposed to confess our sins. You and I are supposed to repent and and we're called to believe this gospel and we're called to be baptized and to exercise this faith through baptism to symbolize our admission that we are sinful and we need cleansed and we have been cleansed through the Holy Spirit that has descended upon us because of Jesus, because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit after he lived and died and ascended into heaven 
We are called to respond to this gospel in the same way. And we're going to continue to work our way through the, the gospel of Mark. And it's my prayer that this belief would sink in in a deeper way in our life, that you would feel conviction, that you would be nudged in the direction of repentance, that you would live out the gospel in a fuller way to bring glory to what he has done for you. So let's pray, and then we're going to walk into a time of communion to remember this gospel together. Lord, we thank you for the gospel of Mark. That, Lord, today we hold in our hands this gospel that, that prepares us to receive you. It prepares us by getting us, getting our attention, by informing us as to what we are to know, and, and by teaching us as to what we should do in response to this information. Lord, we thank you for you, the Spirit who does a work in our hearts and minds to allow us to believe and to allow us to repent. Lord, I pray that we as a congregation would press into this gospel all to your glory, that we would be changed by you, and Lord, that we would live a life that would be pleasing to you by your grace and through your spirit. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.